Nehemiah chapter 5, after surviving the conspiracies of their enemies to uh, halt uh, and hinder the work of rebuilding, and even murder some of them when they got done working, heading home for work, uh, if possible, now the Jews come upon some financial hardships. Let's read the first five verses. And there's a great cry of the people and of their wives against their brethren, the Jews. For there were that said, We, our sons and our daughters, are many. Therefore we take up corn for them, that we may eat and live. So also there were that said, We have mortgaged our lands, vineyards, and houses, that we might buy corn because of the dearth. There were also that said, We have borrowed money for the king's tribute, and that upon our lands and vineyards. Yet now our flesh is as the flesh of our brethren, our children as their children. And lo, we bring into bondage our sons and our daughters to be servants, and some of our daughters are brought under the bondage already. Neither is it in our power to redeem them, for other men have our lands and vineyards. Uh, what's described here is something that happened uh, similarly um, to smaller banks when they get taken over by either a bigger bank or the federal government. And uh, whatever loans those banks have given to clients or depositors, uh, those are now owned by the federal government. And the federal government owns their property and their land as well, and all their collateral. Uh, now they're indebted to the federal government. And as I understand it, this happened to a lot of people back in the 1930s under Franklin Roosevelt. Uh, that the government took over some small banks that collapsed after the Depression, and now the government owned the property and everything the people had borrowed or were indebted to pay back. You don't want to be indebted to the government. We all have enough obligation, we have enough debts to creditors and the government as well, but you don't want the government to be your, your creditor. Um, they're great at giving out other people's money, to others who, who shouldn't have it or, or shouldn't uh, get it because they're unwilling to even earn it first. But uh, you don't want them also being your, your creditor and you get in being indebted to them. Um, the key word here in verse 3, we have mortgaged our lands, vineyards, houses, etc. Notice uh, verse 1, it says, now it came to, or, uh, and there was a great cry of the people and of their wives against their brethren, the Jews. Um, the word, <clears throat> um, go, if you will, to Proverbs chapter 6. Proverbs 6 and verses 30 and 31. Men do not despise a thief if he steal to satisfy his soul when he is hungry. But if he be found, he shall restore sevenfold, he shall give all the substance of his house. And there evidently was some thievery and some uh, stealing and theft going on between Jews and Jews uh, because of scarcity of supplies. And... Um, <clears throat> So there must have been some stealing and grain, etc., going on between the Jews, Jewish people. Verses 4 and 5, again, in our text. There were also that said, We have borrowed money for the king's tribute, and that upon our lands and vineyards. Yet now our flesh is as the flesh of our brethren, our children as their children. And lo, we bring into bondage our sons and our daughters to be servants, and some of our daughters are brought into bondage already. Neither is it in our power to redeem them, for other men have our lands and vineyards. Um, the word usury means an exorbitant interest rate, charging more than is a, a customary or normal um, in the marketplace. And in this case, it included the lives uh, uh, and servitude of uh, other Jews' children. They go into bondage um, to the Persian king, uh, because you owe a debt to the kingdom or into bondage to a fellow uh, Jew until that debt is paid off. Um, 
poorer Jews find themselves at the mercy of richer Jews. Uh, let's go back, if we can, to the book of Exodus 21. Exodus 21, verse 2. If thou buy an Hebrew servant, six years he shall serve, and in the seventh he shall go out free for nothing. And Exodus 22, and verse 25 there. If thou lend money to any of my people that is poor by thee, thou shalt not be to him as an usurer, neither shalt thou lay upon him usury, that charging excessive interest rates. Um, and I think there's one more verse I want to call your attention. Go to the book of Leviticus, chapter 25. Leviticus 25, and begin there at verse uh, 39. And if thy brother that dwelleth by thee be waxen poor and be sold unto thee, thou shalt not compel him to serve as a bondservant. But as an hired servant and as a sojourner, he shall be with thee and shall serve thee unto the year of Jubilee. <clears throat> and then shall he depart from thee, both he and his children with him, and shall return unto his own family, and unto the possession of his fathers shall he return. Uh, for they are my servants which I have brought forth of the land of Egypt, they shall not be sold as bondmen. Thou shalt not rule over him with rigor, but shalt fear thy God. Both thy bondmen and thy bondmaids, which thou shalt have, shall be of the heathen that are round about you. Of them shall ye buy bondmen and bondmaids. There God authorized the Jews to make servants of the non-Jews living in the land of Canaan where he was going to bring them. And um, <clears throat> one of the reasons for that was to keep the Jew humble, uh, or to remind himself that he was once a servant, he was once a bond servant uh, in the house of Egypt. And uh, therefore he should take that into consideration in the way that he treated his other servants. But God allowed them to make servants of the non-Jews in the Promised Land. That's not politically correct, but uh, that's biblical. Um, and let's jump down to verse 6. And read Nehemiah 5, verse 6, down through verse 13. <clears throat> and I was very angry when I heard their cry and these words. Then I consulted with myself, and I rebuked the nobles and the rulers, and said unto them, Ye exact usury, every one of his brother. And I said a great assembly against them. And I said unto them, We after our ability have redeemed our brethren, the Jews, which were sold unto the heathen. And will ye even sell your brethren? Or, or shall they be sold unto us? Then held they their peace, and found nothing to answer. Also I said, It is not good that ye do. Uh, excuse me. Uh, ought ye not to walk in the fear of our God, because of the reproach of the heathen, our enemies? That is a good admonition. You, you walk close to God, obeying God, as a rebuke, as a testimony, in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation, in a world in which you live. Verse 10, I likewise and my brethren and my servants might exact of them money and corn. I pray you, let us leave off this usury. Restore, I pray you, to them, even this day, their lands, their vineyards, their olive yards, uh, and their houses, also the hundredth part of the money, and of the corn and wine and the oil that ye exact of them. Then said they, We will restore them, and will require nothing of them, so will we do as thou sayest. Then I called the priests and took an oath of them, that they should do according to this promise. Also I shook my lap and said, uh, So God, shake out every man from his house and from his labor, that performeth not this promise, even thus he be, be he shaken out and emptied. And all the congregation said, Amen, and praised the Lord, and the people did according to this promise. Verses 6, 7, and 8 are straightforward. They're fairly self-explanatory. He was shocked at what he heard Jews doing to other Jews and driving others into great debt. 
uh, and exacting much more user interest rate, higher in usury rates than uh, they would find anywhere else, even among the heathen. Um, look back at Nehemiah chapter 2. Nehemiah 2. And verse 6. <clears throat> and the king said unto me, the queen also sitting by him, For how long shall thy journey be, and when wilt thou return? So it pleased the king to send me, and I set him a time. Nehemiah was an ambassador, uh, recognized and sent deliberately by the king of Persia uh, back to uh, Israel to help rebuild his own hometown, his own city. You know, the, the word of Solomon's temple, the grand, grandeur and the splendor of that temple was known far and wide, and all the other kings of the earth knew about it, even generations later after the Jews rebelled and the, Is uh, the kingdoms of Judah and Israel both taken into captivity. But the splendor of that uh, temple once upon a time was well known. And uh, some king who thought to enrich himself by sending the Jews back to rebuild that temple and make it just as grand and um, elegant as it once was, I guess was doing it as, as a matter of pride uh, and interest for his own gain, his own uh, ego. And, but Nehemiah was a big shot among the people. In chapter 5, down at verse 18, he starts off saying, Now that which was prepared for me daily was one ox and six choice sheep, and so forth. He ate much better than the average Jew was, was eating uh, during that rebuilding. But even so, uh, he wouldn't abuse his fellow Jews in order to do that. He said there in verse 10, I likewise and my brethren and my servants might exact of them money and corn, I pray you, let us leave off this usury. So he had the uh, ability, the opportunity, to exact high interest rates of those who would borrow anything from him, um, or to pay them less than they expected to be paid in the rebuilding work. But he wouldn't do such a thing. He figured that all the Jews ought to treat one another uh, equally, and be very egalitarian with one another. So. He ordered those who have been controlling the property uh, of others through overcharging uh, to give control of their possessions back to the people there in verse 11, and they agreed to do so in verse 12. Uh, verses 14 through 19. Moreover, from the time that I was appointed to be their governor in the land of Judah, from the 20th year even unto the 2 and 30th year of Artaxerxes the king, that is, 12 years, I and my brethren have not eaten the bread of the governor. But the former governors that had been uh, before me were chargeable unto the people, and had taken of them bread and wine, beside forty shekels of silver. Yea, even their servants bear rule over the people. But so did not I, because of the fear of God. Yea, also I continued in the work of this wall, neither uh, bought me land, and all my servants were gathered thither unto the work. Moreover, there were at my table an hundred and fifty of the Jews and rulers, beside those that came unto us from among the heathen that are about us. Now that which was prepared for me daily was a one ox and six choice sheep. Also fowls were prepared for me, and once in ten days store of all sorts of wine. Yet for all this required not I the bread of the governor, because the bondage of, was heavy upon this people. Think upon me, my God, for good, according to all that I have done for this people. There's a man sure of his own righteousness before God and not um, being a cruel taskmaster over the Jews that were following him in the rebuilding. And he wouldn't uh, overcharge them. He wouldn't be abusive to them. He wouldn't exact usury upon them. And then in light of that, he knew of his own righteousness. He asked God to think positively toward him. Um, so verse 19 is his prayer uh, for God's continued protection as he leads the rebuilding of the wall and the gates. Let's move uh, into chapter 6. We'll read four verses there. Now it came to pass when Sanballat and Tobiah and Geshem, the Arabian, and the rest of our enemies heard that I had built the wall and that there was no breach left therein, parentheses, though at that time I had not set up the doors upon the gates, that Sanballat and Geshem sent unto me, saying, 
Come, let us meet together in some one of the villages in the plain of Ono. But they thought to do me mischief. And I sent messengers unto them, saying, I am doing a great work, so that I cannot come down. Why should the work cease, whilst I leave it, and come down to you? Yet they sent unto me four times after this sort, and I answered them after the same manner. After avoiding the Palestinians in their day, um, actually Arabians, according to verse 1, and others, the enemies of the Jews suddenly want to have a, a peace summit. They suddenly want to talk to the Jews about living side by side. Maybe there's a two-state solution. We can come to some resolution here. Some Camp David or Oslo peace treaties uh, might be in order at this time. Negotiate whose territory is where and where we can, how we can live in peace. It's the same old ploy. The uh, non-Jews in that land of Palestine have been using the, same, using the same tricks, and they're still using them even today, to get good PR. It's a way of looking good in the eyes of the world. They want the world to think that uh, they're interested in peace just as much as the Jew is. But of course, the Jews who have been living under threat of their lives uh, and uh, suicide bombers for decades know much better. But the Jews want to live peacefully in their own land uh, so badly that they keep being misled into a bargaining table by um, the different Arab elements, the different Palestinian elements, or whatever manifestation the Palestinian organization is taking currently. It's, um, it was the false prophets who spoke positively before God sent in Babylon to take Judah captive. All the prophets in Judah and Israel uh, were prophesying that Jeremiah and others were full of hot gas. They didn't know what they were talking about. We're not going to be taken away prisoners, and you know, if we are, it won't be more than maybe a year or two, and it'll all be over. And Jeremiah said, you're all false prophets. If, um, and of course, for that, he ended up being tossed into prison and had, was persecuted and hated by the other false prophets in Israel who spoke smooth things to comfort the king, to comfort the people, make them think um, our enemies uh, certainly aren't going to come and destroy everything here and knock everything down, but they did. And uh, the prophets came time after time to warn Israel, warn the nation of the Jews, it was because of their rebellion against God, their disobedience, their disregard for the laws and the commandments God had given, and it was going to catch up to them one day. But uh, it's the popes all over again. It's uh, Jimmy Carter and Yasser Arafat meeting together. That, that guy, Jimmy Carter, has got to be one of the, the most ignorant Southern Baptists in the world. If he's saved, that's as much as you can say about him. But, and he may be, but the Southern Baptist Church, their statement, their articles of faith, I have never, traditionally, never professed any premillennial coming of the Lord Jesus, any literal kingdom of the Lord Jesus on the earth. They say that sometime in the end of time, God will wrap everything up in a nice, neat package, and they, they spiritualize a lot that ought to be taken absolutely literally. And when it comes to the book of Revelation, other parts of Bible prophecy. Now, there may be a few Southern Baptist pastors who have broken with that denomination's tradition, but their official statement of faith, or, or their articles of, of faith and practice, their booklets they have put out, uh, state nothing about the premillennial return of Lord Jesus and the seven-year tribulation, the man of sin uh, yet to come and rule over the world as the Antichrist, and in the glorious return of Christ to establish a literal kingdom here on the earth, they shy away from all of that and adopt sort of a amillennial position that, that it's not to be taken literally. God's just going to come and wrap everything up and all those Christians will go to be with him. And there won't be some literal uh, playing out of all of those details in the book of Revelation here on the earth. And uh, because of that thinking, they tend to think positively about the enemies of the Jew and, and think uh, extra critically of the Jew himself. That the Jew is the big obstacle to there being peace in the Middle East. Uh, not so. Not so at all. 
I think President Trump went a long way on behalf of the United States for the sake of Israel and recognizing Jerusalem as the proper capital of Israel last year. And uh, the rest of the world hated him, the popes hate him, the Muslims hate him, and a bunch of anti-Semites, wherever you can find them, they hated him for it. But um, as I said recently, you can't say that there's no connection between the economic prosperity the country's enjoying at the moment and the fact that we recognized Jerusalem as the proper capital of the state of Israel. And, and the, the, um, as I said, I don't think Israel needs us to send our troops over to protect them. What we need to do is defend their right to exist. They can protect themselves. In fact, they probably have some of the most sophisticated weaponry and armory that they don't tell us about. <laughs> and it's good to keep it secret. Good to keep it secret. And that Iron Dome that's over the city of Jerusalem, protecting them from incoming missiles to, to uh, fix the trajectory and shoot them down before they even can hit land, that saved countless lives. And the, the security fencing, the border walls, to have only one checkpoint in or out certain areas, that's kept the suicide bombers uh, to a minimum, if at all, um, since, we, since, since they be, began building that. And the idea that walls don't work, just go ask Israel if walls don't work. <laughs> sure they work. Ask the Chinese if the Great Wall worked 2,000 years ago. It's still there. You know, really, since cities don't have walls around them now, and people can come in and drop down from aerial assault, that walls are sort of obsolete in a lot of places. But not always. Not everybody has access to a, a aerial uh, means to go in over a, a wall and fence and bomb an occupied territory or some territory. Um, I almost said call it the Jews occupiers. They're not occupiers at all. They're in the land that God gave them. And uh, one of these days, the Arabs are going to be driven out. And the Muslims will all be driven out. Do you know, um, this hostility against the Jew, the hostility against the state of Israel and the Jewish people, it goes all the way back to a friction between... Um, Isaac and Ishmael and Mohammed look at a few verses here um, before I get carried away here um, verse 2 states but they thought to do me mischief yes they they certainly did and they certainly do today and this is why President Netanyahu uh, is to be prayed for and commended, I think he's a fine man, and uh, he, he, he understands what's going on. He understands you can't trust these people. You, they're right there. You have to live with them. You have to deal with them. But don't trust them or their leaders, their leadership, uh, when they say we want peace. They don't want peace. They want to destroy the Jewish people and take over the entire land of Israel. But um, go forward, if you will, to the book of Psalms. Psalm 83. <coughs> Psalm 83. <clears throat> verses 3 through 5. Psalm 83, verses 3 through 5. They have taken crafty counsel against thy people, and consulted against thy hidden ones. They have said, Come, and let us cut them off from being a nation that the name of Israel be no more in remembrance. For they have consulted together with one consent. They are confederate against thee. You know, when you attack and become an enemy of the state of Israel, or the nation of Israel, the Jewish people, whatever term you want to apply to them, whether they are believers in Jesus Christ or not, you are nevertheless making yourself the enemy of God. That's not something I want to do. That's not something any sane person who's ever read the Bible would want to do. Psalm 35. Go back to Psalm 35. Psalm 35, verses 20 and 21. For they speak not peace, but they devise deceitful matters against them that are quiet in the land. Yea, they opened their mouth wide against me and said, Aha, aha, our eyes have seen it. Also, Psalm 120. 
Psalm 120. Hold on, got my notes. That piece of paper is heavy. <laughs> Psalm 120, verses 6 and 7. My soul hath long dwelt with him that hated peace. Uh, I am for peace, but when I speak, they are for war. And that beautifully summarizes the thinking of all the Arabic peoples and the Muslim peoples surrounding the state of Israel today. Go back, if you will, to 2 Chronicles. Chapter 26, and we're going to finish here tonight. Second Chronicles and chapter 26. Second Chronicles 26, and let me begin reading there. Second Chronicles, Second Chronicles 26, and let's begin reading there at verse 1. Then all the people of Judah took Uzziah, who was 16 years old, and made him king in the room of his father Amaziah. He built Eloth and restored it to Judah. After that, the king slept with his fathers. 16 years old was Uzziah when he began to reign, and he reigned 50 and 2 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name also was Jechaliah of Jerusalem. And he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord, according to all that his father Amaziah did. And he sought God in the days of Zechariah, who had understanding in the visions of God. And as long as he sought the Lord, God made him to prosper. And he went forth and warred against the Philistines, and brake down the wall of Gath, and the wall of Jabna, and the wall of Ashdod, and built cities about Ashdod, and among the Philistines. And God helped him against the Philistines and against the Arabians that dwelt in Gur Baal and the Mahunims. I call your attention to that verse just to show you that the Arabs and the Philistines or Palestinians were confederate with one another seven, eight hundred years before the birth of the Lord Jesus. And uh, like I said, it goes all the way back to the descendants of Isaac, the Jews, and uh, Ishmael. Do you know that that the Muslims have some common distinctives with the Jew? Uh, first of all, they trace their ancestry back to Ishmael as the first son of Abraham, and think that he should have been the rightful and lawful son to inherit all of Abraham's possessions. But according to the Bible, he was not. So they've tried to rewrite world history to say that Isaac supplanted Ishmael and took his possessions from him, which should have belonged to him. Um, but Ishmael had 12 sons. I was reading in the book of First Chronicles this morning, and it lists the 12 sons of Ishmael, just as Jacob had 12 sons, and the Jews traced their ancestry back to 12 tribes. Both the Jews and the Muslims have the same way of identifying clean meat and unclean meat. I think I pointed this out recently. If an animal had a cloven hoof, like a pig, it was unclean. Or if it chewed its cud again, uh, because it had several stomach chambers and partially digested food is spit up again and is chewed again, um, I think uh, certain animals do that, camels do that, and uh, other animals, do, deer, do that as well. But uh, that was considered unclean. However, an animal that did both, re-chewing its cud and had a cloven hoof, was considered clean. Cows are considered clean because they do both. Deer are considered clean because they do both. And Muslims identify clean and unclean clean meat the same way. And um, there's, also, there's also a number of as you read through the Bible, you see a number of Asiatic customs that have survived even today. 
the taking off of shoes because of some place that's particularly special or to be respected. You take off your shoes before you go into the Asian or Korean household. Um, the, the bow as a form of greeting, you see that throughout the Old Testament. Abraham and others bowed themselves. Um, Isaac and or, uh, um, Jacob and Esau bowed to each other after being separated for a long time as a, as a greeting. Uh, the idea of sticking your hand out to shake the other person's hand, uh, that's a, a JPF European Caucasian custom that um, originated centuries later, or may have originated in Bible times, but, um, but the common way of greeting someone was to bow towards them and they to you. And so you see, the Bible is an Oriental book, an Asiatic book. But uh, I'm going to stop right there for tonight. My point there is that the Palestinians, or the Philistines, and the uh, Arabs were confederates with one another just as they are today. Some things haven't changed. All Muhammad did was come and he, he focused all of their hatred, all of their anti-Semitism, uh, under the premise of a religious banner. That, that the great moon god, Allah, wants this land to belong to the descendants of Ishmael. And he gave them some religious way of focusing their hatred of the Jew. But uh, if their true ancestry is uh, against the Jew, or is contrary to the Jew, a descendant of Ishmael, whether they're Muslim or not, they're going to have some sort of bitterness against the Jewish people. And as I've said before, in order for the Arabs to begin to import millions of trees and green up their countryside, much as Israel did with their land, they would have to admit that the Jew was smarter than we were. They haven't done anything with the land. And that's the same thing. You know, the land was decimated after Babylon came in and destroyed all the people and took them away captives. And uh, just as it was during World War II in the 1930s, 1940, 41, 42, along in there, and uh, the Jews come back and they start making something beautiful out of it once again. And all the local people there hadn't done anything with that land. And now the, they see the Jew beautifying the land, making it into something uh, prosperous and profitable once again. And they want to get in on the action. And so they want to somehow take it over as if it was their idea to start with. And it's not. All it is is a testimony to the ignorance of those uh, who, who are driven by hatred more than they are intelligence. The, the Muslim nations that despise the Jew are driven by hatred, not by any intelligent, rational thinking. Dennis Prager points out that, that uh, hardly any new books are published in the Arab world. It's a benighted part of the world that's been living in um, educational and medieval darkness for centuries. And uh, hardly any new books are published there. Um, more new books are published in a week's time in Great Britain or in Western European country like Greece, for example, than are published in a year in uh, Middle East like Saudi Arabia and Iran and Iraq and countries such as those. That is a very benighted world, and they're living still in the Dark Ages because they're driven by hatred of the Jew more than any other motivator. And motivates them, it's their hatred of Israel.